Welcome to Exploring Archetypes. I'm Bren Murphy and this is The Self Academy. Now, the most ex exciting thing about exploring your archetype is no matter what uh, combination of archetypes you choose or you adopt, whether it's whether we take on three archetypes or a 12 archetype model, which are sort of the two most common, um, your unique combination will be completely different to another person because it's always layered with your experience and with your um, environment. Okay, so my life experience and my childhood and my upbringing will definitely add color and flavor to my three archetypes to give me a completely unique blend. Okay, so that was a, a big point I want to get across. Also, the idea or the understanding that all archetypes are neutral, okay? There's not a good archetype or a bad archetype. Because with there's if we adopt the quiz model, which is you are given archetypes depending on your answers, some people, well, I did as well, got given an archetype and you go, oh, I don't like that one. Or you go, I'm not a rebel or I'm not a, a victim healer. You, you sort of have inbuilt prejudices against certain archetypes which are not right okay because each archetype is neutral in shadow or light they are they can all be positive in light and they can all be negative in shadow so the main thing i wanted to say was um explore them with open an open mind and remember that um any judgment you actually make about an archetype needs to be explored and healed as it's more a clue about your own prejudices and your own blockages than the actual archetype itself. Okay, so each archetype names and describes light and dark and shadow characteristics. I'll go here. So the neutral, they, and each archetype clarifies who we are. So there's two ways of arriving at your archetypes. You can... Um, by answering a quiz questionnaire, which we'll do in an upcoming video, or you can, you will know what your archetype is. You'll just read it and go, oh, that's me. That's what I am. Okay. So that's, it can be intuitively chosen. Or a third method is to um, have each archetype um, in a random, like a deck of cards or a, pull them out of a hat and then to apply them more during a meditation or just after a guided meditation so you can sort of intuitively do it and then to assign them to each house or each area or domain of your life as you see fit. So there is a bit of choice involved as well. So again, I've talked about there's two or three archetypes or you can do a wheel of up to 12 archetypes. So the archetype is a map to give you meaning about where you stand in the world. In, and, and in your life and at your stage of life as well. So it gives you clarity, gives you confidence, and it gives you certainty that you know, regardless of whether you're struggling now or you're facing challenges, you can actually reflect on your archetypes and go, ah, oh, and have some clarity and some um, pointers forward for your map to say, oh, that's what I should do, or that's an option, or that's an alternative open to me to not feel that stuck or that overwhelmed feeling that you sometimes might feel when you're not sort of given a an option to go forward. So learning from archetypes, we learn to accept, forgive and heal our relationship with ourselves, okay, as well as explore. So there's two sides, there's the light side and the dark side. And as you can imagine, the light side of the archetype is the positive um and another great word I love, it sounds simple, but it's helpful. So there's either the helpful or the unhelpful. And I like to use that instead of positive or negative because helpful and unhelpful are really, they're less charged. People say, that's not very positive or that's really negative. It's more, a negative statement can be helpful and a positive statement can be unhelpful. If you're cooking a cake and it tastes terrible and someone says it's fantastic, you'll keep cooking a terrible cake. You need a helpful feedback, not positive feedback. You need helpful feedback. 
So helpful feedback would be, I appreciate all the work you've put into the cake. However, it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> so that, that's the point. You want helpful, the, the, um, the spectrum is from helpful to unhelpful, not positive to negative. Positive and negative are sort of outdated and they convey that real old style of self-help where people go, well, I can't say anything negative and they're trying to fit everything into a positive frame and it just really lacks authenticity. That's so much more authentic to be helpful as opposed to not being unhelpful. Being unhelpful, an unhelpful comment is being sarcastic or cynical or critical or mocking, okay? A helpful comment is honest, it's authentic, it's feedback, it's on reflection, it's delivered in a good manner, it's calmly delivered and it helps the person who's receiving it um, get feedback from their environment, from the world to know how to be a better version of themselves in future. And that's what we're looking for. So the big thing now when we look at these 74 archetypes and you go, holy moly, 74. Well, yes, there is 74. And the point I'm making by putting all those up there, I, I still had about another 20 I could put, I could try and squash into the page. The point is that a lot of these um, are just from different um, schools of thought. So, and that doesn't mean they're good or bad. Again, with putting judgment on them. But what I do notice is that, for example, you've got the teacher. This is one I just picked out. The teacher, the visionary, right? The um, scribe. Let's put those together. Teacher, scribe, visionary, um, guide, teacher, guide, scribe, visionary, mentor. See where I'm heading here? Um, well, I guess father or mother. Um, right, they can all be very similar, can't they? Advocate. So those six I just mentioned are all could all be lumped under different versions of teachers or different versions of mentors or different versions of guides, okay? So th there can be a bit of splitting and splicing like Avenger can be a shadow version of a warrior or a visionary can be a light version of a messiah or a martyr like oh a martyr can be a shadow version of an alchemist or an avoider could be a shadow version of a companion a companion who avoids things see what i mean or a beggar could be there yeah, so you see what i'm doing that there are so many different archetypes and you see how um, helpful they are in all facets of society. But today, for the benefits of this, I wanted to just focus on the three that you mightn't have met in, in any other um, research you've done or any other studies you've done with this dilettante, the hedonist, and one that is a bit more common, the lover. So the dilettante is an amateur from a Latin root meaning to delight in, okay? And it's a lover of um all things who doesn't who sort of dabbles in things but doesn't pursue it to the point of being professional or to being critically uh getting critical feedback okay so for sure they'll play basketball but they won't join the basketball team or they won't join a basketball comp they'll just play basketball okay or they'll do painting but they won't enter competitions or they won't sort of submit to any scrutiny or um, do you know what I mean? Uh, they'll play music, they'll do music, but they won't join a band or they won't perform in public. They'll sing again, just privately. So it's all or done uh, off the record or not in a competitive setting or not professionally, not for money. But in the same sense, there's another type of dilettante who is really professional and is borderline um, amazing, which you see in those reality shows like America's uh, The Voice and those cooking shows, MasterChef, where the dilettante is cooking or gardening or singing and they just don't value themselves enough to be professional when they actually probably are quite capable. So that's it can be a shadow aspect there. So 
a lot of times people, it's a lot safer to be an inspired amateur than, a, than to grind it out as an, and take the big jump as a professional. All right, the next one I wanted to talk about was the hedonist, which is like a gourmet lover or a, a bon vivant. That, and that has an appetite for all the pleasurable aspects of life, like good food, wine, sexuality, sensuality, music. So it, it's based on the idea of pleasure being, and it's scientifically backed, that pleasure is a good thing and it helps you know, t- trigger those parts of our brain that give us pleasure. Okay? So I'm sure we can all see how the headness can t- tip over into shadow and be, well, if we look here, we've got the headness can tip over and in shadow could be, there you go, the addict or the beggar, like spend all its money on hedonistic pursuits and become a beggar or become a bully to fight for food, okay? So, or a gambler, to just the love of, the gambling can just go extreme. So it's really good. It, um, the hedonist also reflects the ecstasy of food and wine and those pleasures can mirror a spiritual transformation where people get that incredible high and that incredible connection from indulgence and it's sort of what people push, just chase that like having the perfect meal and the perfect environment with the perfect company on the perfect day. And just to get all that, the the right setting, all that aligned is is a real challenge in life. And to get that right can be something that is never, it's quite elusive. Now, if we move on to the lover, again, we can cross the lover uh, with each column. Can be the angel or the artist, I guess, the child, definitely, goddess, god, Femme fatale can cross over into the lover. Don Juan can cross over into the lover. The damsel, the companion, um, the healer, the hedonist. So what I mean, the lover is literally a liberator and crosses over in so many other um, areas. And it's not just about the romantic angle. It's about a lover of um, the pursuits like of art and music and gardening and things like that. And it's having unbridled and exaggerated appreciation of something like the obsession and the affection for an appreciation. Okay. To the point that you reorganize your environment. So it's, the lover in the light is, um, epitomized when they, their physical environment changes from their passion. Okay. So it's, um, where the the lover becomes in shadow can become narcissistic to the point of having mirrors and changing the body shape, like through going to the gym or starvation to you know reflect their self love gone wrong. All right, so if I move on to the next one, is just another way of looking at archetypes. So we had these um, seventy four, which a je- good sort of covering most, um, pretty much cover many schools of thought here. I've left out some that were really vague and I've covered some of the vague ones. So here's just another flow of archetypes. So this one's a frequency chart just to show how the king and coin are sort of really identified from um, folklore, fairy tale mythology, um, religious texts, okay? Like they're you know, very massive archetypes. Then you've got the other archetypes that pop up in stories. Warrior, judge, healer, teacher, artist. Yes, for sure. Lover, student, martyr, heroine. Okay, so we'll go through. Then you get the least, some other ones that just appearing. Alchemist, the clown, the thief, the trickster. So what we're concerned with are the red ones and the blue ones and the green, not even so much the green ones. Even getting off the track. Just to keep it nice and main, uh, the main primary ones. So having this as a structure is a really good way to go forward and have some clarity about archetypes. In the next video, I'll go in detail into some of the specific archetypes and I um, hope to see you there. Thanks a lot.